Uh, the next four weeks we have in Ephesians, out of the five that's left, the next four weeks talk about the ways in which we as humans relate to one another, the way we connect to one another, how we interact with one another. Um, and hopefully you guys had a good time at one night last week, but if we stretch our memory way back to the, to the week before that, to two weeks ago, Paul really left us with a transition verse. We're talking about the corporate nature of the church. We're talking about sanctification. We're talking about uh, salvation. We're talking about all this stuff. And he leaves us with this. In Ephesians 5.21, he says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that's leading Paul into what he's going to be talking about for the next uh, 30 verses or so. And this one verse... Um, has two things in it which I think are opposed to our culture. One that's more blatantly opposed, another that is more subtly opposed. And the first is submission. We hate submission um, in our culture. We don't want to be subject to laws that we don't make. Uh, we don't want to be subject to, to views. We don't want to be subject to, to, to people's music. Put your earbuds in. We don't want to hear your music. We don't want to be subject to you relationally. We want to have authoritative power in our lives to do what we want to do. We want to be subject only to our own desires. But the caveat of that is, is that I want you to be subject to my views without me being subject to your views. We all want people to believe what we believe, but we won't want to believe what others believe unless it's what we believe. And it's this kind of contradiction that's going on. No one wants to be in submission to anyone except for themselves. Um, and we see in Ephesians 5, moving forward, we're going to see whether you're male or female or a master or a worker or a children or even Christ himself. None of you are Christ himself, okay? So it's not if you're male, female, or Christ, okay? Male, females, and Christ. Um, Paul's painting this beautiful picture of whoever you are, wherever you are, being interwoven in this web of submission that is beautiful. This web of submission that is life-giving. This web of submission that is worship-inducing. And, and it kind of stands as opposites. Where our culture says submission kills. Don't ever go under somebody's view. Don't ever let anybody tell you what to think or how to live or who you are. But scripture says submission gives life. And we're going to look at that in the following week. Scripture says that the best life for you is one in submission not only to Christ, but in submission to one another. And the second aspect of Ephesians 5.21 that I think stands out against our culture is one that's more shrouded. And we saw not only are we to submit, but we're to submit to one another. This, this one anotherness we see time and time. It's a drum that Paul keeps beating in the book of Ephesians, talking about the church. How we interact with one another makes a statement about the kind of God we believe in. And we are to be concerned for others. We in the church are to labor and minister for one another. In Ephesians 4, it said we are called as, as the saints, not, not just as the pastors, um, but as the saints to work and build up the body of Christ towards Christ. We are laboring in one another. Why? Because Christ has ministered to us. So our driving point, and you guys have been talking about this the last couple weeks in community group, and you're going to do it again this next week in community group. The reason why we as Christians serve one another is because Christ has served us. That's the only sustainable call to service is what Christ has done on the cross. And we would think when well, we're talking about one anotheredness, um, which is a word I may have just made up, uh, that a culture that boasts tolerance would love one anotherness. But really, when you, when you step back and look at what our culture is doing in the name of tolerance, um, you can see that it really cares very little about one another. I mean, millions of babies are killed each year because they're not us. We're not being killed. They're being killed because they might infringe on the rights or the abilities of somebody else. And so they're being killed because they're not us and they may impinge and may cause someone, else, um, someone else's life to be altered in a certain way. They can encroach on someone else's lifestyle and so we justify the murder of babies. Belgium just became the first nation to get rid of an age limit for euthanasia an age limit for physician-assisted suicide, which means that if you're an eight-year-old um, who has cancer, as long as your parents say it's okay, you can go to a doctor and that doctor can kill you through lethal injection. And so at an age where they can't drive or smoke or have sex, they could make decisions as to can I live? Can I be allowed um, to, sh oh, should I be able to press through this in my life or can I just tell somebody to kill me, and then the state will approve a physician killing a child of any age as long as the parents agree to it. 
And you see, in the name of peace and freedom and tolerance, there hasn't been a celebration of life. There's been a devaluation of life. Life is seen as less meaningful, as less robust, as less joy-producing in the name of a, a, of a religion of tolerance, which seems to boast that the best thing for you is to serve other people. But their service of other people and their openness towards other people is really an oppression of other people. And the world's oneness not only changes how we treat one another, are you considered worthy of life, are you considered worthy of rights, it also changes how we view one another. And that's really what Paul's going to be talking about in these next few passages. Um, Paul in this text is going to use words like husbands, wives, males, and females. And in Ephesians and in so much of Paul's writing, Paul is emphasizing two distinctions in the creative order. The first distinction is God and man. There's God and then there's created man. The second distinction that Paul always seems to harp on is male and female. And while male and females are are co-equal in their ability to relate to God, um, Peter calls it, we are joint heirs with Christ. Male and female don't interact with God differently. It's not that God has likes males and hates females or loves females and hates males. We have equal access and equal worship to God, but we do interact differently towards each other because of the way God has created us. And this distinction, this distinction between male and female um, is becoming increasingly dissolved and removed in our culture to where it's no longer cut and dried. It was once a hard science. You were either born male or you were born female. And not only is it dissolving, but the, the debate around it is becoming increasingly hostile. There are some people that if you were to call them male or call them female, they would respond in anger towards you because you're pigeonholing them as something. They get to decide what their gender is. And so the debate in the secular space has become increasingly heated as to how we view one another. Do we view each other as male and female? But it's not only in the secular state um, that we're running into this, but inside of the church, there's all sorts of dialogue over gender roles as well. And that, inside the church, which ought to be a place of love, inside the church is a place where hostility and hatred is starting to boil up towards one another because of how we view the interaction between males and females and their roles and relationships. And so Paul's going to talk about these roles and he's going to talk about these relationships. But before we look at those, before we look at how we interact with one another, I want to pause and I want to look at how God created gender. Just, just We're going to stop and we're going we're to put off roles and we're going to put off uh, how we're to interact and how we're to respond and how we're to worship. We're going to talk about that in the following weeks. What I want to look at today is why gender? Why is this an important thing? Why is there male and female? Because if we don't understand God's design and God's purpose and God's goal in gender, then we will be caught up in a debate. Because if there's no purpose for gender, then it is something we can debate. It is something that's subjective. We don't have anything to stand on, but when we see clearly why it is that God created us, male and female, we have a concrete ground to stand on. And when we look at God's glory in gender, we can begin to see our relationship towards God in a right way. And when we have a right view of God, that enables us to have a right view of self and a right view of others. And so only when we have a right view of God can we adequately view ourselves and view others. And so that's what we want to do um, tonight. And so I just want to pray for us, uh, and then we will roll. So, Lord, we come before you um, on, with a need to hear Uh, with a need for our hearts to uh, be willing to accept. Um, And just as I mentioned earlier, and as we sang, Lord, present to us a picture of God that is worthy of worship. Um, And I thank you that's not hard for you. I I thank you that uh, the the face, you, 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 you told Moses that if anybody saw your full glory, they would die. And Moses saw a sliver of it between two rocks, and his face lit up like a light bulb, and he came down from a mountain that people were terrified of him because your glory was so radiant against Moses' human flesh. And so, Lord, I pray you make us open to um, a view of you that is worship-producing, a view of gender that is awe-inspiring, and a view of life that is evangelical towards your glory. Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen. 
Amen. So what um, I want to do tonight is I want to set the table. Okay, tonight, we'll, uh, there wasn't a scripture reading tonight. Our, our verse tonight is Ephesians 5.21. So if you're, if you're really into taking notes and you need a verse, our verse is going to be Ephesians 5.21. And we're going to set the table for the next few weeks. Okay, we're setting the table for talking about gender, for talking about how we relate to one another, and we're going to do so by looking at four ways in which gender reflects the glory of God. Four ways in which gender reflects the glory of God. Um, but what I want to do first is I want to read to us a portion of Genesis 2. Um, in Genesis 2, we see uh, the creation story. We see a more detailed story than is given um, in Genesis 1, and I'm going to read it. It's not going to be up on the screen. If you have a Bible, you can follow along, but really what I want, I want you to hear this story because this is narrative um, here. God is explaining to us what happened because there's a power in what happened. And so I'm going to read verses 5 through 9 and then verses 18 through 25. So here's Genesis 2. When no brush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up for the sprung up, for the Lord God has not, had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist, mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the middle of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And skip ahead to verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. I just think that's fun to name animals. I heard a comedian once say, it's like, why is it that, that, that carrot is carrot and orange is orange? It's like, it's like they brought the carrot to Adam. He's like, that's a carrot. And then they brought the orange. He's like, shoot, orange. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, that's probably not what happened. Uh, but begin up again, verse 20. Um, stick to your notes. Uh, the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every burst of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while sleeping, he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into woman, and he brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is my bone of my bones, my flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So the first point um, I want to look at tonight, and we're going to go back and refer to what we just read. The first point I want to look at is that um, gender is ordained for the glory of God. Gender is ordained for the glory of God. Now, we just saw the story of God creating man and woman. Um, that is the story of creation. If you want to know where man and woman came from, you just read it. There wasn't some other process working behind the scenes. We saw the creation, the first breath that man took, the first breath that woman took, the woman took. We just read it. And in Genesis 1.27, he, he reiterates it. And he says, male and female, he created them. Now, I want to add some weight to this because not everybody sees like male and female, he created them, and we just like fall in reverence. Um, we, we don't see that as awe-producing and glory-stirring, um, but I just want to show us and present to us um, a little more behind this. What makes this glorious? Well, if we're to look at Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 4, uh, which we've looked at this year, Paul says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So what does this verse have to do with gender? Right? That's a very salvation-oriented verse. What does that have to do with gender? Well, not a lot specifically, but what we see there is that God's plan was not arbitrary. God, before the foundations of the world, 
chose and predestined a plan in which man would be, would be adopted into Christ. You see, it was predestined in eternity into the mind of God. God knew what he was going to make. He planned not only what he was going to make, but what was going to happen with what was made. That means that God's created act was purposeful and it was thought out. You see, there are times, like, how many, I was a Lego guy um, growing up. Like, I loved Legos. That's the most exciting thing I'm looking forward to as a parent is to the age where you could give my son Legos without giving him death. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to that. But never once did I go into my Lego bin and be like, this is what I'm going to make. I just didn't, I didn't have that foresight. And what I would do is I would get, you always start with a base piece, right? So you find the base piece and then you get the wing pieces. And I was super symmetrical. I couldn't have like three things on one side or two on one or one type of gun on this side and another. They had to be perfect. And so I just dig through the box, forming this thing that really didn't find an end. It just kind of kept adding levels and like incinerator beams and portal wipes, and I don't know what those are, um, but, but I, I had no purpose in what I was building. I just built. I had the capacity to build. I had the power to build. I had the tools to build, but when God had the power and energy and tools to build creation, he had a purpose in it. It's not that God had all of this power inside of him, and he sneezed, and the world was there, and he's like, well, shoot, now I better put people in it. What are we going to do? No, God was intentional in his creation. God was diligent as a master conductor before an orchestra, bringing forth aspects and notes that would climax for his glory. God's plan was male and female before creation even began. God ordained gender. And what was God's plan in this? I love Isaiah 43, 7. God says this, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. See, the, the, this is where we see the intimacy of the glory of God. God is saying, those who are mine, I have called and I have created you for my glory. Why does God call forth Christians? Why does God assure for himself a people for his glory? What a beautiful thing. We are here for God's glory. We are here so that God may be magnified through the word, through worship, through prayer, and through fellowship. And how, if we look back at Isaiah 43, 7, how, what is a manifestation in that verse of God's glory? If you look back at it, it says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed, and whom I made. How did God manifest his glory he called himself a people, but he formed himself a people. He made himself a people. God formed you for his glory. God made you male for his glory. God made you female for his glory. Not out of apathy, not out of indecision, not out of drawing straws. He made you male or he made you female out of a passion for his glory, out of a zeal for his name. Psalm 133 and 139, 13, a verse I'm sure you guys have heard. For I formed, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. See, it wasn't random process and science, chromosomes and genomes and hearts. Um, it wasn't just that. That happened, but God worked the the the. I'm not even going to try to use science words. Work the little things to come together to form the big thing, which was your gender. God did that. God knit that. God formed that in foreknowledge for his glory. It's kind of cool to think about. It's kind of awe-producing to think about. You see, gender is no accident. Gender is no trifle. Gender is the fingerprint of God's glory embedded in your very DNA. Your gender testifies to a sovereign, creating, glorified God. And, and Paul talks a lot about Thanksgiving and worship in this book. Right? He, he, he says, you want to kill sin? Put on Thanksgiving. You want to be good in a community? Be thankful. Worship always. Be thankful always. And that could be a burden to us because we're like, well, I'm not thankful always. 
I'm not worshipful always. But if we, we see the world through the lens that Paul sees the world, it's a lot easier to be worship-filled and thankful. Because if, what, if we believe what we just said, it should really enhance any conversation we have with somebody. Like, like the reality, the weight of the issue is, I don't think I've ever walked into a room, saw somebody and been like, you're, you're a male. You're, you're a male for the glory of God. Never once did I do that. And yet all of this backstory of beauty and planning and drawing forth glory went specifically into your chromosomes and specifically into your genetics so that God may manifest his praise in who you are. And be thankful for that. In subtle ways. Don't do what I said because you won't have many friends, okay? Do that in your heart. Don't do that outside. But do that. Be awe-inspired awe when, you when, when you're in church on Sunday. Look around and see the people of different heights and different shapes and different skin colors and different backgrounds and different locations and all this stuff. Look at them and say, God knitted them in a womb in his foreknowledge for his glory. And if that's not sanctity of human life, I don't know what is. How we can kill that in the womb and then kill that when it's terminally ill at any age is something beyond the scope of my comprehension. God created life and gender for a purpose for his glory. But that's not all. Not only has God made us different in our gender, but our gender is distinct. Gender is distinct for the glory of God. And this distinction just goes um, it, to, to show more of God's comprehensive creativity. It's not that God made a, a, a black Chevy Camaro and a red Chevy Camaro, and the only thing different is what we see with our eyes. But gender is distinct genetically. It's distinct anatomically. It's distinct visually. It's distinct emotionally. I mean, just think about it this way. Uh, if you were to take a baby boy and a baby girl, and you were to remove, because there's that whole nurture versus nature thing, and people say girls are girls just because of Barbie. Um, and, and so take away the Barbie from the girls, take away the G.I. Joe from the boys, take away dads who want sports and moms who want dancing, and you just let the boy and the girl grow, they will be distinct. You will be able to look at those two people and say male, female. Why? because hair, because body attributes, because size, because they're different. Now think about that. That's natural. No one has to tell a girl to develop traits of a girl physically. It just happens. But think about, think, think, think about how much work people go through when they want to hide their gender or when they want to act like a different gender. Makeup, cosmetics, surgery, clothes, posture, all of these things to attempt to hide what God has naturally made as something which is a distinction between us. It takes effort, it takes work, it takes money, it takes concentration to try to hide what God had designed. And see, I love this because um, th there's, we, we're moving into a new age in terms of American Christianity, where we are going to come in contact with Christians who have had sex change operations in their lives. And the beautiful thing about that, as beautiful as you can get with something that tragic, is that you can mangle flesh, but you cannot alter your gender. God created you male or female. And there can be all sorts of biological things that could happen that could complicate that, but God doesn't make oopsies. God doesn't do that. And so we have a distinction in that. And God created men and women not only distinct physically, not only different, um, he made them distinct uh, in terms of their roles. We saw in Genesis 2 um, that it said, God made all of this stuff, but there was no man to work it. And so what does he do? He takes some dirt um, and, and he piles it together, and then he breathes into the dirt, and man is there. And then what does man do? He's like, go work. See, work was part of a perfect world. 
Man worked. He worked the fields. He, he named animals. He, he, he tended the garden. He worked. Man was a caretaker of Eden. And then what did we see with woman? God created her as a helper, a helper fit for man. That was God's purpose. Eve's role was not to be Adam. Adam's role was not to be Eve, but they had distinct roles inside of that creation. It's not like, oh, well, I don't have somebody to do this, so I should probably just, we should figure out something. God designed this because God planned it, and God sovereignly, before the foundations of the world, had this plan. You know what Adam's name means? Man. Like, that's it. There's no, like, my name, Tyler, meant resourceful. Yeah, right there. There's an Adam. Your name is lame. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, it was just his title. The, the name Adam was just the generic, when we see it in Genesis 26, which we'll look at in a little bit, it was man. Like, man as in mankind. Broad name. And it's like, Adam was so generic that he took that as his name. He's like, I am man. What it, my name means resourceful and industrious, which I still don't know what that means. Um, but, but his name was man. You know what Eve's name meant? Mother of all living things. Life giver. Man. <laughs> and like Adam. It's just, see, there's an Adam in here. It's just an ugly name. <laughs> Eve. It's, it's just, it's a beautiful name. And it's the mother of all living things. And there's a nurturing component that we see in Genesis 2 that is still active today. They were named because of how they acted. And, and, and you see, my wife was never um, a baby person growing up. Um, and now that we have a baby, every baby in the world is hers. Um, she wants them. She wants to hold them. She wants to see them. It, we, I've rewound commercials at my house to look at babies. <laughs> Not because of my desire. <laughs> my wife has this desire to, to nurture babies. And I've had some of you ladies over at our house and no one comes swooning to me they go swooning to Owen. Where for me, not my baby, not my problem. It's like, I got mine. I love him. I thrilled with him. I enjoy him. Your baby can clean its own diaper. You go love it. I, 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 I love babies, but not in the same way my wife loves babies. And you see, there's, a, there's, a, there's an aspect, and this is just a microcosm, um, but there's an aspect where how we act was hardwired into us by God. And I saw something that um, was really funny uh, this week that really stood out to me. Michael Sam, I don't know if you guys know Michael Sam. Um, he's a defensive end for the University of Missouri, and he is going to be uh, a pretty preeminent draft pick coming up in this year's NFL draft. And he came out two weeks ago as saying he was gay. Um, and there's never been an active homosexual player, never been an openly active homosexual player in the NFL. And so it's a huge deal. Um, people are talking about it a lot, um, and they were interviewing him. And so here's the thing, is, is typically proponents of homosexuality hate gender roles, right? Because you're not acting like a gender role. Males can act like females, females can act like males, males can dress and talk like females, females can dress and talk and act like males. But, but what I found was extremely interesting is here is a gay man who is telling a story, of, and they asked him, How, what has the support been like that you've gotten from your college community? And he said, he said you know what, um, it was amazing. I felt like I wanted to cry, but then I was like, you know what, I'm a man. I'm not going to cry. And I was just like, see, if anybody had an excuse, and I'm not, the, the ideal man of the Bible is not a man who never cries, okay? Well, that's, that, that's a masculine, chest-pumping, testosterone-driven stereotype that is sometimes hostile. Um, but... But at the same time, he knew that there was a distinction to how men should act. He knew that there was a distinct way men and women should respond in different ways. And we are distinct in our roles and in our relationships towards one another. We interact with each other differently in a whole number of different contexts. And next week, we're going to dive more so into those roles between male and female and how we interact. Um, and I actually have a resource here. Uh, for you guys. Um, this is, it really is a big issue in the church today. It's a big issue in culture today. And this is a great little resource. It's by um, John Piper and Wayne Grudem. It's only 60 some pages long. It's called 50 Crucial Questions, an overview 
of central concerns about manhood and women, womanhood. And the questions, you can find a question that interests you and they just give a paragraph to a page response. I have 10 of these, take it, read it, um, come back next week, okay? If you want more, I can print some up for you at church. It's also a free PDF online. Um, but come and get this because this is a great, this makes my job easier. If everyone reads this next week, we'll take two weeks off, okay? Um, but this, uh, this sets things up um, and answers things in ways uh, that I'm not John Piper or Wayne Grudem. Um, and, and so we're going to talk more about those roles next week and how we interact with one another. Um, but, but I want to talk about why we have these roles right now. So God made us. Uh, gender is ordained. Gender is distinct. And the third point is gender is complementary to the glory of God. And this is the part I love. And in each of these, we see, God's, we see God's foreknowledge and God's power. We see God's sovereignty and God's knitting we see um, the distinction, which testifies to his creativity. And we see a, a complementarian relationship, which I think testifies to God's efficiency and God's ability um, to work. If we look back, well, there that goes, um, to Genesis 2, <coughs> verses 20 through 22. Uh, listen, so listen here, pay attention. Um, you could not pay attention later, pay attention later. Uh, the man gave names to all livestock, and to the birds of the heavens, and to the beasts of the field. Um, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of the ribs, closed it up in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into woman, and he brought her to the man. So one thing I want to clarify here. Um, is because we, we're seeing uh, marriage happening here in, in one sense. Um, Genesis 1.18, and I think it gets twisted out of context sometimes. Genesis 1.18, which we read earlier, does not say God looked at man and said, it is not good for man to be alone. That is not what it says. What it says, it is not good that the man should be alone. And so God looked at Adam this Adam, the specific Adam that was before him, and he says, it is not good that the man, that this man be alone. You see, this is important because what Genesis 1.18 is not saying is that if you are a Christian, you should be married. If you are a man, you should seek marriage. If you are a woman, you should seek marriage. Those things, um, Paul says, are, are lofty, are good, should be desired in certain senses, but Paul actually pushes back from that. He says, Sometimes it's best not to be married. Jesus wasn't married in this. So it's not saying that all people should be married, but it does show that there is a goodness to God, or a good, there's a goodness to God, and there is a goodness to marriage. Good was brought on Adam through marriage. And so now if we look back at verses 20 through 22, uh, we saw that Adam was set up in mantropolis. He, he, he was set to work, and he was set to work in a place where it would never be frustrated. Like, guys, we like working on things. We like tinkering on things. We like doing things. And the only thing that frustrates it now is that it's frustrating. Things don't always work the way we want them to work. It's hard. Thorns, thistles, sin, the fall, things like that play into it. But Adam had this thing where he'd go out in his garage and get, like, three nuts and a bolt wrench and, like, build a motorcycle, like, right there. Just drop of the hat. He'd build it. He, he had all the wild animals and the beasts, and there was no death, and so he was like bareback riding on lions and tigers and stuff and naming them. Um, it's just like, ah, like tropical jungle, Adam naming, working, swinging, eating trees, just goodness. Um, and yet, God, said, God, God looked at all of this. He looked, at all, he looked at all the animals. He looked at the freedom, the joy, the celebration that Adam had. And he said he did not have a helper. And so God looked at the entirety of his creation, a creation that was complete without one thing. And without that one thing, he said there was not a helper fit for man. God's solution for a helper was not another man. It was not, uh, it, it was not an Xbox. It wasn't a dog. It wasn't Siri. God's solution to man's problem was woman. God saw that it would be good for Adam to have a helper. And so God purposefully 
made a woman to fill that specific void that Adam had. That's the story behind the creation of, uh, of the woman here. And this means that in a relational context, God made woman explicitly for men in terms of compatibility partners. There is no greater partner, there is no greater helper, there is no greater compatible relationship than that between a man and a woman. And this in the context of what we see um, is marriage. The, and not only is this a relationship um, that is compatible in terms of anatomy and in terms of um, attraction and in terms of nature, but it's one that is also compatible in terms of flourishing. Eve helped Adam, and Adam worked better. And Eve worked better because of Adam. It was, it was economic. It was efficient in this. Ad, Eve was made from Adam for Adam, and Adam was made to take care of the things which were under him, the things which helped him, the things um, that he was a caretaker over. And this joint venture in Scripture, and I love this, and, and, and women, you in here, if you get married one day, your father will present you. Um, to your husband, and we do that. Why? Because God made the woman and he brought her to the man. God gave away the first woman in marriage to the first man. And so where do we see marriage established? I, I was in school here um, with uh, some people who were really hostile towards biblical gender roles, towards biblical views of marriage, and I remember sitting um, around them once, and they were saying, oh, marriage is this medieval notion that the church made up to subdue the masses and have power. Marriage was made in the second page of the Bible. <laughs> it's like that there was no church at this point. There was no pope. There was no church structure. There was no money to be brought out. There was no economy based around uh, dresses and venues and, and ministers and stuff. Marriage was established by God when male and female were created. Okay? You can't go back past that. <laughs> Marriage finds its divine origin not in man, but in God. And we see that in <coughs> verses 24 and 25. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. So how is marriage, how are complementary gender roles connected to the glory of God? Because that's what we're after. We're not after arbitrary things. We're not after gender roles for the sake of gender roles. We're after the glory of God. We're after worship. How is this connected here? Why should we care about marriage and gender in the public square? Why should we fight for this? Because look at what we're going to be looking at in two weeks. Ephesians 5, Paul quotes Genesis 24 through 25, and he says this, Therefore man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. You see, gender roles matter because marriage matters. And when God sovereignly created male and female, he did so as a shadow of things to come. He did so that our relationship would be on a small level a picture of Christ the ultimate man coming to redeem the bride of the church and giving his life so that the two may live together in symbiotic harmony and worship and joy and celebration and love for all eternity. See, gender matters because the gospel matters. Gender matters because gender um, the gospel is hidden inside of gender. You see, gender is evangelistic to the glory of God. This is the last point. Gender is evangelistic. Gender is a proclamation to the glory of God. And the thing I love most about how the Bible discusses gender roles is that Whenever Paul or a biblical author goes in talking about gender roles, he comes out talking about the gospel. Why would we not want to talk about that more? He comes out from this picture, and we're going to see this in the next two weeks, both with women and with men and with masters and with workers and with children. He says, this is who you are, and the gospel changes that. 
This is who you are because the gospel. You see, the gospel matters to gender, and gender matters to the gospel. And gender gives us a context for a greater capacity to worship the gospel. You see, in the context of marriage, gender is extremely important. It's a representation. We're talking about it in two weeks. I, Ephesians 5, 25 and following is, 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 is typically preached as this is man's role, but really there's no sweeter presentation in the gospel than in that Ephesians 5 passage. I can't wait for that. But for you in here today, the majority of you are not married. You're not married, and we're going to talk about that a little more in the coming weeks here. But gender as a single person is still evangelistic. It still proclaims the beauty of God, and we see this in Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make man, see there's the generic Adam, in our own image, after our own likeness, and let them, see them, it's plural, um, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God made man, generic man, in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. See, God created man, humans in a corporate sense. He created humans in his image. And then what does he say? Male and female, he created them. You see, gender is absolutely necessary to view yourself correctly. But gender is even more necessary when it comes to depicting God accurately. You see, God designed male and females because men reflect the glory of God in a way women don't. And women reflect the glory of God in a way men don't. God made both so that in different ways, and yet in the same way, who we are and how we act presents a full picture of God. That's why the church is so important. Because the church is young and old and male and female and diverse and ethnic. And the more diverse the church is, the more glorious God is because all of the gifts that the church has and all of the, the, the traits that women have and the traits that men have and the weaknesses, uh, or the weaknesses aren't represented, but the strengths of women and the strengths of men, those point that there's a God who is all of that. There is a God who is perfect in that, a God who has no lack, who needs no helper, who is eternally perfect in every aspect of his existence. See, gender reflects the image of God. And why is this important? Because the gospel is important. Facebook made a couple changes a few weeks ago. There are now 50 different ways that you can describe your gender on Facebook. I went and looked at it today because I'd heard rumor of it. Um, and so I went and looked. Um, there, there are three standard ones, three options, male, female, or neither. And then it says, how, it's, it gives an example it could be, uh, wish happy birthday to him, wish happy birthday to her, or wish happy birthday to them. It doesn't even make sense. But in addition, you could select custom, and there are options under custom. 50 options, some of them gender fluid, female to male, male to female, trans man, trans female, two spirits, neutra, non-binary, neither, gender queer, trans person. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And as I was reading this at first, I wanted to laugh because some of these, like two-spirit um, and, and uh, like neutra, I don't even know what that is. But as much as I wanted to laugh at these at first, it really, it began to grieve my heart that something so natural, so simple, something that was birthed had been so tainted to a place where they are trapped in a life detached from God's glory, detached from God's good, detached from God's gospel. See, the issue in, in homosexuality and gender confusion and all this kind of stuff isn't a loss of gender. It's a presence of unbelief and sin. God ultimately created gender not because gender is a be-all, but because God's glory is a be-all. And when we're in the presence of God's glory, we're either presented with salvation or judgment. And what these people need is not gender. 
What they need is the gospel. But in God's grace, the gospel works on even the most confused and mangled body to restore gender. There are people in our church, in, in, we, we think of this as something that doesn't necessarily happen in Missoula, Montana. There are people in our church who struggle with same-sex attraction. And this side of the fall, there'll be real ways where, where Christians will wrestle with that. Biologically, mentally, prefer preferentially, they'll wrestle with that. But the beauty is, is that the gospel corrects sin regardless of your sexual preference. The gospel corrects sin regardless of what area it is that you are sinning. But the point still stands that Jesus said that we will be hated as Christians because of our Christ, but I never thought that that hatred would be seen in being so bold as to say male and female. But a time is coming, and a time is here in certain senses, where there's those terms will be met which, with great hostility. And what was once a hard science has now been turned into a personal decision where your gender is a choice. And we as Christians need to not back away to not say, well, the secular world can have their thing and us church, the church will keep talking about gender. We need to be vocal about this. We need to take a hard stance on this, not because we care about gender, but we care about God's glory, and God has chosen to exhibit his glory for our good and how we relate to each other as male and female. The stance we take on gender is more than a stance on anatomy. It's a stance on salvation. And we stand up in opposition to sin, not in an arrogant desire to be right out of a self-righteous motivation, but we do so because we have a heart for the broken and a desire to show the glory of Christ to those who need it most. And so some of us need to repent of how we view gender. Some of us in the Christian church see gender as we drew a short straw or we are not we feel like we should have been made something else. Or even inside of that, as we're moving forward, we wish that, that our role were a different role. But God gave you that role and gave you this body for his glory so that people may see the goodness of God. And so we seek to relate correctly to one another inside of our gender because we want the gospel to be proclaimed with our voice and also with our bodies. And so we seek to have an awareness of God that trickles into our gender, and we seek to live our lives in that gender in a way that is God-honoring and built around that which God has built. The weight of gender is tied up in the gospel of glory. And because of that, we as the church seek to worship the God who created it, the God who sustains it, and the God who redeems it. So leave here worshiping a God who created gender, and leave here preaching the beauty of Christ as proclaimed in gender. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, it's the simplest thing. Oftentimes it is the first thing we notice when we meet someone, whether it's obvious or whether it's uh, more vague. We are always, is this a male, is this a female? You've made us to think that. And Lord, you've done so for reasons that were purposeful, for reasons that were intentional. And so, God, as we um, try to uh, be a, a, a congregation, a people who labors for your glory, make us more mindful of the beauty in our gender. Stir us to worship out of the simplest and the first way in which we see ourselves when we get up in the morning and we look in the mirror, that person is not there because it, it evolved and took on a shape or made a conscious decision. It is who it is because God designed it for his glory. And Lord, we pray um, that you give us steadfastness, courage, in the face of opposition, but more importantly, God, we pray you give us with a hope that we can give away to a world. In a world where this is such a hot debate, you have given us a great platform for evangelism. Not a platform for hate, not a platform for discrimination, but a platform for restoration and worship as we preach the importance of gender being rooted in the importance of the gospel. 
So we love you, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen.